Testing, testing. It doesn't quite work to quiet people down. Welcome uh, everybody to this afternoon's forum. Uh, my name is Kim McKechnie. I'm the Executive Director of Communications here at the University. I want to apologize for changing the location of the room. Uh, I think all of you may have seen some news yesterday from government that probably increased the interest in this, so we decided we would uh, uh, get a bit bigger room. Uh, I'm going to cede to President Timmons in just a minute to do a full presentation on uh, uh, the government's transformational change agenda. I do want to say in advance that uh, this is being recorded uh, and that if you choose to ask questions afterwards, and there will be a Q&A session, uh, that those questions will be recorded and put online so that people who couldn't make it can uh, go online and watch the forum. Uh, so after uh, the presentation is done, I'm going to leave this mic at the uh, stand in the middle aisle. So if you want to ask questions, please uh, line up at the aisle. If you have any kind of mobility issue, maybe just raise your hand and uh, we'll watch for you and, and uh, bring the mic over. And Mark's bugging me because he's trying to line up at a mic that doesn't exist. <laughs> Anyways, I will hand it off to President Timmons, as well as you might uh, hear from our two uh, Vice Presidents, Vice President Chase and Vice President Button as part of the presentation. Yeah, Over to you. Thank you so much, Kim. Their seat, Chris, everybody dug their seats up here if you want to come. So you don't have to stand. Like you like standing, that's okay. So, but there are a few seats still and... Um, I, well, I'm so thrilled to see so many faculty, staff, and students. I want to do a special shout out to the students that are here. I see it. Maybe put your hands up. How many are here? Looks like we have a few of the students. <laughs> Ray, are you calling yourself a student, Ray? <laughs> Good. So, um, this, uh, I wanted to give a fulsome presentation uh, to give you a sense of where we are in uh, the idea on a transformational change that the government put a call out to us for. And I want to acknowledge Roger, who's here today, because Roger brought up a really good point at uh, the council meeting about the powers of uh, council and, and the powers to bring transformational change. So I'm just, and, and I said to Roger at the time, Roger, we're not going to agree on this, and I'm going to put up the presidential powers here just to help you understand that. Ideas come from everywhere, right? And these five transformational change ideas came from the university leadership team through the president, through me, to you. And, and in the act, I'm able to do that. So that's what I wanted. Um, Rogers, had, and he has a wonderful paper that he put a lot of time into that I encourage any of you to read, uh, to have his perspective on whether government or board of governors can direct the academic path of the institution and it's a it's a really good paper so I would encourage you to do that but I wanted to put I know that's really tiny I think the key thing is is that the the president um, has a general supervision over and direction of the academic work of the university and this is part of the direction of that we're, I want to bring to you and get your your input your consultation what I hope at the end of this meeting is that we will be able to talk Tell me which one of those five do we pursue and to go forward, or if you're open to all five of them. And we've done a lot of consultations that I'll share with you as we go through. So that's the outline. So this is um, from our strategic plan. It is our mission of the university, and all of you know that. You've all participated. It came from you. I wanted to give you a picture of our operating expenditures where we are and this is important as many of you know that yesterday the government took um, back one percent of our operating and it is a challenge because in three months January February March they want one percent back uh, claw back on our operating and you can see there is not a lot of flexibility in a university budget and we're you know to have it when you have three months left in your academic year to to claw back that and it's going to be a challenge and we've been quickly meeting and working through scenarios and we'll be working with the deans, directors, AVP, VPs on how and where we find that money. What I am going to make a commitment to you at this time is that, you know, 
I'm, we're not going to impact any of the teaching from January to April. That is sacred for us, and so that we're not touching any of that to find the, the, the $1 million. So that I, I will assure you of that as we go forward. But you can see the majority of our budget is salaries and benefits. And this is in the context of the government's position on transformational change. This is what we presented to the Treasury Board when we presented. We basically said that if, um, when we look at our revenue and expenditures, uh, we get our provincial grants, a little few federal grants, we get tuition, and if we get a zero and zero, we put zero tuition, zero grant at this point, but we know we can play with that, that we would have to, uh, we'd have to find $5.7 million. So if we got zero tuition increase and zero from the government, gives you a context that we're living in as a university. And we can speak to you more about the budget, but this is basically a basic flowchart, expenditures and revenue. And if we get zero, zero, what will happen? And that means zero increase in enrollments too, right? So that's zero all over the place. So even if we get 1% or 2% in government funding, we often have to find efficiencies to get a balanced budget. When you look at our operation, and there has been a lot of talk that the University of Regina, that, that Saskatchewan has the highest um, revenue per student government funding. <laughs> And it's true, and that, but it's not Regina. Uh, because University of Saskatchewan, for a small population, has, has medicine, has um, occupational, not occupational, physiotherapy, has dentistry, has law, they have a lot of programs that are subsidized by government at a high level. We don't have those type of programs. So when you look, now this was from the High Your Education Quality Council of Ontario. This is not ours. This is apples to apples from an independent source that shows where the University of Regina compares to Quebec universities, Ontario, Manitoba, PEI, Nova Scotia. And there you can see we are a very lean campus. And this would be the government funding we get per student. So take a look at that, because I think it's telling. And we did present this to the Treasury Board and emphasize that this campus is lean. We don't have a lot of extra that we can draw on. So transformational to date. So what we did is the university executive team met on August 23rd to talk about a definition of transformational change, trying to get ahead of government on this so that we, we, had, we invited government to come speak to the university leadership team. I had a meeting um, with the University of Saskatchewan and SAS Poly, and the VPs and men in government relations met. They, neither SAS Poly nor U of S had done much on transformational change. So we shared what we were doing. Then, at the, then I had a conference call with the two presidents and tried to get the same, we need to do something together. And we haven't, I haven't got much momentum there. I'm going to keep working on that with them. The university leadership had a retreat in which we identified everything we could think of around that fit the definition of transformational change. And uh, they proposed ideas. We settled on five. We, we did share that with the ministry, always with the caveat that this has to go. One of the processes that we put in place, the principle, was that it would be highly consultative and opened. Come on in, there's seats up here in the front. Come on in, Don. Come in, Susan, up here. So that we would, whatever we do, we would, these are ideas only that we were going to take to our campus, and we wanted to make sure that they were clear that any one of these ideas can fall off the table or be replaced by another idea. Sorry. Right. We talked about transformational change to data. We feel that the university is constantly in transformational change. Just look at the enrollments um, since 2008. If that isn't telling in terms of how you manage that with minimal government increase, in particular over the last four years, uh, you have to transform as a campus to manage that kind of growth. Area of indigenization, we have been working hard on 2008. We've been doing many, many things, and, we're st and that is transformational for our students, for our campus, and it, it's changing students' lives, both non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal students. International campus, we've been working hard 
we're making sure that students in Regina, at the University of Regina, can work with students from all over the world so that they get a global education and perspective. And, it, and we talk about transformational change, if we want to talk about it in an economic way, which the government does, just the growth in international students brought us $11.1 million in revenue. That's been transformational for the campus. That's how we've been able to manage of the, much of the challenges that we faced in financial, uh, <coughs> with financial restraint. The UR Guarantee Program. We've had two students come back for, for, to get their tuition covered. But the UR Guarantee Program uh, has been transformational. And we now have, I think, John Smith, <laughs> is he here? John, we're about 1,700 or 1,800 students who have enrolled in that, who are working through the f whole four years, uh, getting work, putting in a ton of time and getting all kinds of extra, extra supports. And it has resulted in an 8% increase in retention for those students. We talked to the government about experiential learning, the co-op program, the service learning program, how that's transformational for our students and for our community and how much it helps the students financially um, at university. We talked about the partnership with SAS Poly on nursing and how that has been transformational for our campus. The College Avenue, Cam uh, the College Avenue campus renewal, that is transformational. So we said transformational change is what we do all the time. There's nothing new for us to do that. These are the principles that we put forward on the, for us on transformational change. It has, to, it has to align with our STRAP plan. It has to promote accessibility for students. It needs to be responsive. We need to be accountable to the public and to the community. And whatever we do needs to be realistic and achievable. And that's consistent with our minister's five objectives in the budget letter. We said the process we would undertake would be an internal process where we would have to have consultation and bring, build some consensus with faculty, staff. It would be cross-institutional, and I have to say I have not been successful on that yet. I'm still working to get you, University of Saskatchewan and SAS Poly to work with me closer on this. Um, and that whatever we do has to have a positive impact on our students, on the community that we're responsible for. So that's what we said were the principles and the approach. So we came up with five proposals. I'm going to go through each one. I'm going to ask um, the two vice presidents to speak to them, but I'll give you just an intro to each one. These are the five that we're bringing forward to you, and what I'm hoping we get a direction from you on, let's pursue this, let's drop this, or if any of you have ideas on additional initiatives that we can bring forward, we would be thrilled. Gladys, there's a chair in here. You want to come? You're okay? Harold, you okay? No, okay? All right. So let me talk about the exploration of Research Park. Right now, we spend about $1.5 million renting space in Research Park. That we do. We're a great partnership with them. But we thought it would be a way for us to maybe, uh, not maybe, a way for us to support and help the government and possibly have a great benefit for campus. But whatever we do on this would have to be based on a sound business plan that meets the principles that we've identified. And um, this is not a goal for sure. It's an idea and a concept. So I'm going to ask Dave Button to speak to it, please. Sure. My mic on? Yeah. Good. The uh, Research Park, it's something that we've been in the business of with them in partnership since 1998, transferred uh, about 100 acres of land at the time to take and be able to take and build synergies to take that research and theory from the idea uh, that starts in our labs and research spaces and then actually take and grow it eventually to commercialize if possible. We found that we just couldn't do that on the core parts of the campus. We needed more growth and what better way than to partner uh, with the research park. Already huge success up in Saskatoon so we transferred uh, the land with the expectation that it would be developed into research opportunities and things like that on our campus. We've noticed over the past couple of years there hadn't been as much activity. Hadn't, there was an initial spurt at the, uh, early on in things. And so in working with the uh, uh, research park folks, uh, this isn't a surprise to them either, suggested, well, is there another way for us to be, perhaps be closer to it? 
same sort of ideas were being generated up at U of S. They're doing the same sorts of things. Right now, of course, there's a, a common uh, crown corporation that takes and runs the research parks uh, together as an independent board. Uh, we're suggesting that maybe there's an opportunity to take and uh, rejuvenate a little bit about the idea of uh, research activities, create opportunities, and actually take a little bit more closer ownership. Some of the principles that we'd be thinking of, we can be assured that this isn't something that we jump into at high risk, but obviously there's huge assets there uh, in the park. There's uh, some uh, debt that exists, but the asset's worth an awful lot uh, more than that. So it would be a matter of us going in with, uh, with opened eyes, coming up with a, uh, uh, a governance structure and a pricing model and our own internal governance to take and manage and control it, of which there's many different options. So at this point, it's just a seed that's being planted to take and identify, is this something why we want to get closer uh, management and control log, and can it help government in the process? So I'm going to go through them all, and then we'll open the floor for questions, okay? So if you hold the questions. Um, when we talked about transformational change, the only thing that I heard from government, I heard it from our Minister of Finance, I also heard it from the Deputy um, to the Premier at our retreat, when we said, tell us what you, how you define or what you're thinking of in terms of transformational change, and the only thing they brought up was program duplication. And so, you know, I talked at the university leadership team, you know what, ever since I've been here for eight years, I've heard this. Do we need two faculty of educations? Do we need two faculty of engineering? Do we need two? And you know, it's time to say, well, let's find out. Is, if there is duplication, let's face it and deal with it. If there's not, then let's stop saying that we need, do we need, instead of having it out there all the time. So I, I'm not worried or concerned I, if we have an external team that comes in and evaluates it. So this is what we, uh, we are calling for, and I'll get um, Tom to speak to it. Can you hear me in the back? Um, the, the three that are named there first arose in a comment made by the Minister of Finance at an earlier update. You probably recall that about five or six months ago. And he said speculatively at the microphone, why do we have two faculties of education, nursing, and uh, engineering? Um, that, I think, reflects some puzzlement out in the province, particularly in the rural areas, people who don't perhaps understand the, the lie of the land and the educational needs of the cities and the regions, saying it doesn't, make, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that in a province of 1.1 million people, we have two education programs, two engineering programs, and so on. As Vianne has said, though, uh, we are very confident that if we did undertake an external review, and that would be outside eyes, probably eyes from outside the province, we would do that collaboratively with the University of Saskatchewan and with the ministry. We are very, very confident that the evidence would show that there is no reasonable definition of duplication there. Both of those faculties, both faculties of education, both faculties of engineering, and both faculties of nursing are effectively full. Engineering has different specializations at Regina than it does at Saskatoon. The education programs at Regina differ from those at the University of Saskatchewan and so on and so forth. Plus, the most recent data that we've been able to see is that most, if not all, of the graduates of both programs at both universities find employment within six months of graduation. So there is not a labor market oversupply. There is not real program overlap. There is an appearance to some that a faculty of education at Regina and a faculty of education, to use that example at Saskatoon, don't make a lot of sense. More recently, what we're hearing, because this was a speculative remark from the Minister of Finance, is that the real attention needs to go on to nursing. And again, not that there's oversupply, but that the kind of Frankenstein's monster, quite frankly, that government created in the two-provider, two-city model, where we are teaching in Saskatoon, and the University of Saskatchewan program is teaching in Regina, does need a look. Is that the best way to do things? But again, both faculties of nursing, our program in collaboration with Sask Poly, and the University of Saskatchewan are full. So we're putting this out. If we were to do this, we would talk to CCAM. We want your input as to whether you think it is advisable. And again, to echo the President's remarks, we are absolutely confident that any external review would show that there is no call to amalgamate either education or nurse, education or engineering. There may be a call to look at how we deliver nursing, but that's not an amalgamation of Saskatoon and Regina faculties. It's a rationalization of teaching in each other's cities. I'll stop there. 
And if there's areas that we can get more efficiencies, then we want to know, right? So that might help with that. The seamless credit transfer, and I, for the last number of years, been uh, I was working with you of S and SAS Poly on a committee to look at credit transfer, and it baffles me that we still have problems transferring credit between University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina. So what we talked at university leadership team was that the University of Regina could take a lead on this and, and be completely student-centered and focus and support a seamless credit transfer for students. We know the data on transfer students. Brian has given it to me. Students who transfer into the University of Regina do better academically, are more successful than the average students. So this is not an issue around well, we're going to take students with low quality. The students are transferring do very well here. But it is cumbersome and challenging for our students to figure out the pathway. And so we're looking at that. So I'll get you to speak to that, Tom. Again, just a, a few very brief additional details. The registrar, Jim Darcy, and his team are beginning to look at some principles there. What we want to do is automate the process more fully. We want to reduce uh, duplication of credit, trans credit transfer evaluation. We want to establish a database so that if, let's say, somebody in the Faculty of Arts, I'll pick out Faculty of Science, there's Maria back there, has already evaluated uh, a course from the University of Winnipeg in linear algebra, that we make sure that that is cataloged properly so it doesn't have to be reevaluated two years down the road. That we really try to make the process seamless, automated, and reserve the decisions that need to be made about new credit transfer to the academics. That would not change. But again, this is something that needs to be thought through and talked about. The other thing that we would hope is that an end goal would be that if you receive an offer of admission to the University of Regina as a potential student, at the point of the offer of admission, you have a clear indication of what we will accept as uh, transfer credit at that point, which we hope will encourage more students to transfer into this environment, into the University of Regina, in an increasingly competitive so environment. Stand? Because the next couple are yours too. Seamless <laughs> academic program approvals. So, you know, when we were listening and talking to faculty and deans, there is a perception that the, it is slow and multi-layered to get program approvals through. And there is a perception that the role of Senate in program approval has more rubber stamp than actually true analysis and approval. And so we want to take a look at that. And I flowed out, do we need Senate? Do we, do we need a reconfiguration of Senate? Do we need a different pathway and stream? All those questions we should be asking. That doesn't mean we have a solution. We've already decided we're going to get rid of Senate. These are good questions to ask. And these are questions that, I, that we deliberated at ULT. And you want to, we'd like to move this forward. So you want to speak yeah, to that? Yeah, just a couple of further comments. Our Senate and the University of Saskatchewan Senate are practically unique in Canada in the way that they're structured. Most university senates are roughly the equivalent of our council or executive of council and that their bodies made up almost exclusively of faculty and student representatives. The idea that you have a room full effectively of community and alumni representatives as the final, uh, final body, legislative body for program change is pretty unusual in the country. So we're asking the question, is this best for the U of R at this stage of its existence? To go back down the chain though, um, at its worst, by my calculation, a major program change originating in a departmentalized faculty can require up to eight stages of approval before it hits, or as it hits Senate. Senate would be the eighth. And the question we're asking, initially through CCAM, is, is this effective? Is this an effective use of our time as a community? Or can we streamline that while making very clear that curricular design and curricular approvals have to remain in academic hands, in the hands of the experts. But can we cut out some of those eight steps at its worst and get program approvals done more quickly? Okay, and this was the last one. Stay up. <laughs> so this one came that we, we now through CE and um, is Harvey here? Is Harvey here? I don't think I saw we that. Are, we, we do run a, a lot of our programs over 12 months and through often CC or some of the faculties, like nursing has an accelerated nursing degree. When we plan programs, we go in planning them on an eight-month cycle. And can we st do that still, but also look at a 12-month cycle, accelerated options for students? I know that my son was very involved. He was president of the student union. And he looked everywhere for a summer course that could fit his curriculum, and he found it that was a week-long um, that we had to be 
in place. He had to do pre-work and post-work, but he had a week long of classes, 32 hours. And he did that so that in the fall, when it, while he was student union president, he could take four courses and get his degree in four years while being fully engaged as president of a student union. And he, he was surprised at how few places that could, could accommodate these kind of requests. So what we're doing on this one is really focusing on students and flexibility in a new age. And you want to speak to it? Just every time I think I'm off the hook, I've got to stay up. Um, I'd like to begin with a couple of examples that are already in place. Uh, the Faculty of Engineering is effectively now a 12 month a year operation in terms of how students structure their programs, including the co-op term. Uh, the Faculty of Nursing last year or two years ago introduced an accelerated option so that students who wish can finish the nursing degree a year earlier than normal. And there are all kinds of things like this that are in fact already ha happening around campus. We think we need to have a discussion, given the needs of students and the way that they're changing, about making more opportunities available. And that can take all kinds of forms. I think there's some worry immediately, and I saw it in one of the posts to the, the council um, discussion board. Does this mean increased teaching loads? No, but it could mean the opportunity for a faculty member, say, to teach in the May, June, or July, August term, and the September term, and then have the January term free for research. So it doesn't mean an increase in teaching loads. It means re-looking at how we distribute uh, our teaching and what we make available to students when. On our campus now, with the opening of the, the new towers, we have about three million square feet of usable floor space. And between May and August, a large part of that is vacant and unused. So we're asking ourselves, again, collegially and consultatively, can we make a better use of our space, our facilities? Can we make more opportunities available for students whose patterns of demand are shifting? Do we move more inventory online? Not to detract from face-to-face, -face, but do we move more inventory online to make it available to students during those periods of the year? So that reflecting a completely different demographic from the one that I grew up with, we best serve students in this, um, in this uh, 21st century world. Thank you. Can I sit uh, down? Yes, you can. So. <laughs> so just in summary, we, we felt that we wanted to step up to the challenge the government put in front of us on our terms, with our agenda, with a student-centered approach that focused on stuff that maybe we should be doing anyway, like credit transfer stuff. But it might give us that push that we needed to do uh, it itself. So I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you, a respectful discussion. These are ideas and concepts were floating out there. And I'm hoping that through, through consultation with you and the deans are consulting with their units as are others, that we will identify the ones, if all, that's great. If there's additional ones, that's great. Or if we want to drop some, that's great, that we take forward. And anyone that's taken forward will go through the proper channels then. So you, you, we have committees. We have executive council. We will not bring something to executive council that hasn't gone through the committees of council. You, we are really committed to having this done right with a proper process. So I'm looking forward today to a really respectful dialogue with you and give us your input, your direction. And if you have any other suggestions that you think will, will work, then I'm looking forward to hearing it. So I'll open the floor. Somebody wants Mark to stand up? Uh, it's so close and tempting. It's so tempting. <laughs> I, I guess uh, one of the things I just want to say is I think at some point I want to write a paper entitled In Defense of Inefficiencies because uh, it depends on how you define those. I think that our Senate and our campus's unique uh, rootedness in community is a strength, not an inefficiency. Now, if we want to have a discussion about how to approve or how to uh, change or improve the cumbersome eight-step approval process for a program, that's a very different conversation than musings about abolishing Senate. And so I'd um, welcome a campus committee to look at how to streamline that process, but uh, I'd be vehemently opposed to any discussion of abolishing Senate. And so I wonder if you wanted to comment on that. Well, I, I'll, I think that's the kind of input I'm looking for, Mark. And so, you know, and I'm the one who was doing the musings, by the way, and I think uh, and I, I don't apologize for saying, you know, is Senate serving the kind of purpose it could serve? And it's a community body that I think can have great power 
as a window to the community. But is it a needed step in the program approval model? So I, I was a bit controversial when I said abolishing Senate, but I'm open to re reconfiguring Senate or even maintaining Senate's role. But I, I think we should look at it. And so um, I'm, that's the kind of input that I'm looking for. Like I'm hearing from you the streamlining of academic probe of food, a good idea, something to look at. Caution around musings even around abolishing Senate, right? Okay, good. Anyone else? Roger? Sorry, if no one else is wanting to, I'll speak. Um, uh, I guess one of the things I, concerns I have is still about the governance question. And clearly, for example, the first proposal to uh, purchase Innovation Place, if I was the Board of Governors and that hadn't come before the Board of Governors for to say, yes, we're okay with you talking about this on campus, we like this on campus, I think as Board of Governors I would be concerned. And of course, you did get the approval of the Board of Governors because it clearly falls under their area of, of the Act. And so similarly, the kinds of concerns I'm raising about this needing to go to council, it could go, it can go to other parts of council, right? It could go to faculty of council if council has delegated the authority for the discussion on these matters to, fa uh, to executive of council or to these other bodies. Because this is transformational change, probably it does have to go to council. I don't know. You'd have to look at the terms of reference for those committees. But I'm glad you're planning to put it through those processes. I think it's good to do that at the start rather than at the end because if there's a direction that council really doesn't want to go to spend a lot of time talking about it, maybe isn't a great idea. Uh, but that's an efficiency question, I guess, about that. I do want to give a few suggestions, though, okay. uh, especially if, if, if you, you know, in terms of moving this forward, uh, especially around, you know, if you were to move it to council or other bodies. In terms of the second one, uh, so if the concern is focusing on uh, nursing, education, and engineering, uh, then you ought to narrow the focus. I mean, you don't want to bring in a mediator, or not a mediator, a person to do the review uh, if it's only focusing on those three areas, who knows things about all the other areas of the university? I mean, you, I think you'd want to put a motion that says, we will put work with other universities to look at those areas. Uh, and that defines the purpose, and I think that makes it clear and makes people comfortable, right? You don't want everybody on the campus fretting, right, about the results if this is what we want to focus on. And the other thing, too, uh, keeping in mind whatever motion is put to the respective body, we can't mandate other universities to do this with us, it would have to be an invitation that's or right. what have you. So that's, that's just one, a few points about that first one. The other thing I, I think too, in terms of some of the criteria for, for that review that will put you in good stead, is also pointing out the costs imposed on students, right? If a student from the U of R has to go to the U of S and, and rent accommodation, it's going to be about 31,000 extra dollars to their degree. And pointing out that it would be improper to impose that burden, I think, is a very strong case for the university. Another strong case for the university is the fact that a lot of our degrees, whether they're professional programs or liberal arts and sciences, students have no exposure to at high school. And so unless they're very motivated for some reason, we would basically be saying if we only had that program at the U of S or the U of R, we're going to be selecting our future educators only from the catchment area of the U of S or our future actuarial students only from those areas. And so I think that's another important case. And then finally, it also we need to look at the revenue side of things too. Just because we consolidate one thing at one campus doesn't mean all of the students end up there. What will happen is you end up having this hemorrhaging of, of, of revenue to anywhere else that students might want to go. Yeah. So that's the first one. The seamless transfer credit, I think a, a motion to council or executive of council would be fine just with the qualification that you say, assuming the appropriate academic oversight yeah. of whatever, that's fine. In terms of uh, streamlining the process of academic governance and program of approval, there we're getting into questions of, of the act. I, my view, it, it would not be advisable with the current government situation to open the act. Right? We do not want to have the government opening our act. Uh, so what we want to do is make sure that whatever proposals are, are there work within the powers of the act. So for example, the Senate, for example, can, Senate, can delegate any power it wants to council. And council can delegate any power it wants to whatever body it wants to. So there's a tremendous flexibility there to keep a Senate, which is good in terms of the social capital and so on, but consolidate some of that decision making. So I think that's, that's perfectly fine. The other thing too is the council does have the, uh, the responsibility for you know, the oversight of programs. And so that would have to go to CCAM, which I think yeah. is what's being proposed. So that's good. But again, 
other parts of the university can't refer items to CCAM, right? Council would need to refer this to CCAM, which I think they would. I think council would say, yeah, that's a good item for CCAM. Come back with a report and tell us what you want. Uh, the last one, maximizing program offerings. Again, uh, I think we, uh, I, I don't have anything much to say about that. In terms of new things that we might do, just two points. The first one is transformative technologies. So the campus, I mean, our the Saskatchewan is going through tremendous challenges because our current production systems aren't sustainable. And we've got people all across this university who are looking at sustainability issues and production. We should be looking at a motion that brings together that expertise around transformative technologies. And the second part of that would be thinking about how universities transform themselves in crisis, right? We've got historians on this campus. We, know, we have people who know how historically universities have innovated in crisis, and that could be another subpart of, of that kind of emotion. So focus on transformative technology. Yeah. So thanks, sorry I took the, no, the time. Thank you, I, I just asked so that we make sure we record the suggestions. Okay, right? I can give you yeah, that's good, an email, I love that. So, great comments. Other comments? Yes. I was wondering if uh, so I was wondering if you could um, provide a little bit more detail on how this research park could be a net revenue rate generator because at, at least I know myself I'm not very familiar so uh, that is one and my other comment is I appreciate um, the conversation because my first reaction to this external review program duplication was we legitimizing perhaps a claim that is not uh, based on evidence so uh, I appreciate that this is an external review that it's perhaps going to uh, have the jury out there and then put this uh, issue to the rest so I appreciate that. Yeah. So that's what I'll speak to first and then get you to speak to research sure. part. So I, I I was head of education at St. Evex in Nova Scotia when they did the rationalization of teacher education. And we, we had, we did, they, the government closed Dalhousie's teacher education program, St. Mary's teacher education, St. Evex's teacher education program, and Teachers College. We fought back at St. Evex and got reinstated. But there's still four teacher education programs in the small province of Nova Scotia. Right? So I've, I've been through that. Often, they were going to do computer science next, and after the horrific experience they had with education, they didn't do any more rationalization programs. So, you know, I, I think if they, if they decide to look at one, they'll see all the pitfalls that, that you mentioned, the principle of accessibility, the <laughs> challenges about this. You know, it, there are still education faculty members at St. Mary's University which doesn't have an education program to this day teaching there and that happened in 1994 because you can't just get rid of the, like you don't get rid of the faculty you are obligated to and we would be too so the, I think once anyone looks at this logically at, and they'll say it doesn't a, a province of over a million is a big province having two is not that many right in terms of a province with this base look at uh, Nova Scotia, which is a tiny province, and space-wise, it has four teacher education programs. So I, I do think in nursing we can learn. It's a brand. It was a brand new program, a different model. We can do s some learnings from that. And my sense is that we will find maybe some areas we can tighten up in the nursing program. My sense, as uh, the provost mentioned, from the uh, University of Saskatchewan, they're not interested in going with education engineering, but they're open to nursing. Government, my sense from government is the same thing. Now they're back, like we called them on it. You want to do it? We'll, we'll do it with you. We'll, and now they're backing off and saying, well, maybe we'll just look at not redundant, like duplication of the, the faculties, but maybe some efficiencies we could get in nursing. So it's a very different conversation that we're hearing now. And you want to speak on the research park? Uh, sure. And, and just so I get the right, the right context, which part of it that was the you were exploring? One of the points was that could be potentially a net revenue generator. So sure. If you could just yeah. briefly. Like sure. Most of us don't know. And maybe, uh, maybe I'll speak in terms of net benefit positive. One of the things I did speak a little bit about was being able to take and uh, develop research opportunities easier. Like if we have more direct uh, engagement and control and things like that. I, I over the, the time I've been here, have watched a number of different 
uh, opportunities for research sort of die on the vine because of space and things. You just don't have it. And so the whole concept of the research park was to build more speculatively, to be able to take and seize opportunities when they came. And so if we have more opportunities for our researchers to be able to take and uh, uh, when they get research money, they can't wait for four years for a building to be developed and, and all of those things to come together. And so one aspect is just to be able to improve our lot in life and our capability to take and, uh, and, and help drive the research agenda. On the other side, which I think you're getting more to, is just the, is there a financial benefit to it and things. And uh, with, with any, any asset and things, which is the research park is basically in the business of pay, taking and developing those speculative buildings, renting them out like a landlord downtown, but with a specific targeted uh, group of people, focus of course being around research, taking and being able to take and, uh, and generate revenues. So, for the right price and things, without getting uh, in, into risk and things, there are perhaps some opportunities. That, that isn't why I personally would suggest we take and pursue them. I'd be saying that this is if there's enough other net benefits of just engaging in uh, uh, and, and helping out research endeavors, and if it were revenue neutral, with minimal to no risk, then that, that to me would be a, uh, a milestone. But one of the things we'd be ultra cautious in is if we, one of the models would be that there's assets in there in, there in terms of the buildings. You take and do the appraisal based on uh, marketability. As the president mentioned, we spend a million and a half dollars of our own every year renting space from the, the research park as our partner. So that's about, I think, one eighth of the total amount of space in the park right now. And so it's those kind of revenue, like if you've got good solid tenant base and you've got a good solid asset, uh, there's lots of business people that are in there making lots of money on that. But well, we would do a, a very comprehensive <coughs> business plan and analysis. We'd have to, the board would, wouldn't, wouldn't approve us moving forward if we didn't, right? The other thing to mention is we have a lot of other lands. We have the land where the community gardens is, <laughs> we have some land on College Avenue, we have the land from beside Sias, and in 10 years, 15 years, those lands the university may want to develop, and then maybe we have a mechanism to do that work, right? Right now, we don't have a land trust. U of S does, UBC does, some Fraser, like many universities have, Calgary does, have done this. Said We didn't have enough land that we were looking at before to set up a land trust, so this may help us with that. So it might leave you just some knowledge and expertise to help us with other lands that we have, which is good. Other questions, comments? People who think we're on, on a path we should keep going on, or people who think we should not, just even would be helpful if we need to get a sense of what you think. Silence is my worst enemy, right? <laughs> because I can interpret that any way I want, and then I'll get myself in trouble. David, sure, do you want to, we need you at the mic. So David and then Joe. <laughs> Uh, I agree with uh, that the university is always transforming, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and a lot of the proposals that are being talked about, I can agree with, uh, especially the idea of timetabling. I mean, we're dealing with a system that was maybe designed 20, 30 years ago for students that are much different. But when I hear about transformation from the provincial government, I hear it uh, for the purpose of saving money. Absolutely. Uh, and while a lot of the proposals that are mentioned might, t some of the proposals might tie into that, I'm kind of struggling to see the connection between, for example, timetabling and saving money or um, seamless credit transfers and saving money. Uh, I just, I just, uh, I'm just seeing a bit of a disconnect here if we go to the, the province saying these are things we're talking about, whereas so what they want to see, I'm suspecting, is is the bottom line. I mean, yeah. where can we save money? Where can we be more efficient? They do. Excuse me, versus transformational. So this is perfect, David. I mean, this was a big debate we had, but we decided that they weren't giving us any definition. They weren't giving us any guidance. They just used the word transformation, and of course we know it means save money, right? So we thought, well, we're going to define it, and for a student, that seamless credit transfer will save money. For a student 
who has to, you know, to get three credits transferred instead of zero, that saves them money, right? And helps us with our faculty, maybe that we're not duplicating efforts. So there is some efficiency there. But we decided, we did present this to government, and I thought we would get a pushback at Treasury Board that's saying, you obviously don't get it. But we didn't. We got the Treasury Board said, we think this is, well, we really like that you're thinking about this, that you're using it in, on your campus, that you have different ways, five different strategies you're bringing forward for conversation. They knew it was only for conversation. So um, they, they, that was my, one of the worries when in Treasury Board saying, are they going to push back and say, you, you don't get it, we want you to cut, cut, cut. And they did not. They said, this is what we, it's a great approach that you're taking. Now, they're still probably going to cut us. Well, they did yesterday. So, and we're not naive. We know that. We know that. But we, we wanted to at least thought that maybe we could, and maybe we have eased that cut by doing this. Because I know that when the minister called me yesterday, she said, initially, it was a lot worse, she said to me. She said, we worked hard to, to and the Treasury Board presentation helped to get the cut to the 1%. So maybe... It, it helped with that because we look like we're being proactive and trying to, to bring some initiatives. I don't know, right? Joe? So maybe you've answered uh, part of my, my comment that I was going to make more in the question is that, first of all, thank you for trying to get ahead of this um, with some ideas. And I welcome council to get, get ahead of this as well with some other ideas. Um, because at the end of the day, I think what we saw yesterday really doesn't matter. I mean, the government. Well, it may have. We don't it know. It may have, right. So I hope that's, that's positive news. But, and we know that the economy is not going so well in the province and budgets will be tighter next year. So transformational change, I think we should just be looking less maybe what the government wants us to do, but what we need to do internally because we are, we are going to be forced to do transformational change. Yeah. And so I welcome, I welcome other ideas. I, I do too. I really hope that, that you'll come up with some and send them forward for exploration. Questions, comments? So next steps, maybe I'll talk about that. So next steps in, is that what I, I'm going to ask is the provost takes the four that have to do with academic matters and gives me a plan of action for each of them, and particular ones that have to, to be taken through the Council Committee on Academic Matters, or Council Committee on Budget, or Council Committee, any of the Council Committees, so that we get a plan and that we honor our academic approval processes. And I'm going to ask uh, the VP admin to work with the University of Saskatchewan. They've already started that, and have conversations with Research Park and and maybe put forward and start getting the conversations going with the government. I want to check with you, is that all right? Does anyone have a different suggestion for me, a different path? Any of these can fall off if it goes to the Council Committee on Academic Matters and they say, well, we really don't think that we have, there's a need to streamline academic program or once we look at it, then that's fine, right? We'll honor that. Chris? Yeah, so that um, triggers a question for me sure. then. Process, so VP admin, VP academic, where's the VPR in this? So how come these transformational changes? The academic mission is teaching and research. And so I'm hearing about how we're doing things for, and the only word I heard from about research came from the VP admin on the research park. That also gives me concern the university is in the business of teaching and research. We're not in the business of real estate management. We're not in the, we may be by design, but the, I don't think those are, those are things that just come to us. You have to manage residents, you have to manage this. To actively seek it out opens up a whole area of now we'd have to put our energies into becoming real estate experts. Yeah. Our energies are finite. They're pushed to the boundaries already. We need more energies put into becoming better at research and better at our teaching missions. Our research right now, InfoSource, puts us at our lowest ever in rankings. Our dollar values are on a steady decline down in terms of research. 
the only thing I see there that really speaks to what the government wanted, and you said that yourself, the government did come back with you with something, and they talked about, you know, what's this, the issues around nursing. That is a huge issue. If I'm riding my bike to work every day and I'm seeing on, you on Regina Transit, come study nursing in Regina, and it's U of S. I, I mean, I can't believe that the government, and you're right, the government created this yes. crap. Now, yay, maybe we get to fix it. That's a good place to be putting all this energy because that, that helps students, that helps t faculty, that saves money. So yeah, let's put lots of energy in there. I worry if we start spreading ourselves thin on our expertises and try to become real estate people, that's not a good idea. To address the idea about things dying on the vine because we don't have space, that's an internal problem then. That's not gonna be fixed by this. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. And I do worry, we're talking about all this and in investing, when our research successes are on the decline. NSERC, so I sit on the NSERC committee um, for discovery research. U of R last year, 33% success rate for established researchers. The next lowest across Canada is 50%. The average is 75%. We're 33%. So transformational change, absolutely. I worry when we get bogged down in trying to be ahead of the government and anticipating what they want or don't want. So I haven't heard anything about process for transformational change that involves the VPR. And so that so that's would really be, a good and question. I'll end there. Yeah. So there's you know more comment than question, I guess. No. But those are my thoughts. And that's a great question. VPR was intimately involved in all of the work around identifying the five. So he, he was at the table with us. Um, Chris, I would love if you brought forward some suggestions around how to support our faculty in the research produ productivity. And uh, I've asked the VPR to give me a plan specifically around Tri-Council. And he is, I know, working on that for me. So it has not been neglected or put aside that we are having many discussions about. I don't want, I mean, I, if we look at McLean's and the shirk results with, with the bottom. I, I don't want that. I'm like you. I'm thinking, what can we do? How can we support our researchers? And, and what's, what's going on that, that that's happening here on this campus? So I have asked the VP research. And there is some efforts being put into that for sure. So um, you're absolutely right. Around uh, the real estate management, um, I don't know what to say that except that many, many, many universities now uh, have a land trust to, to manage their lands the university lands, to help generate revenue to support those three, acad three academic missions, research, teaching, and service. And so we're not, the f we, we've got, there's lots of experience out there, lots of people doing it. Uh, we'll, we were, were late coming into the game on that, and, and maybe universities shouldn't be doing it, but many are having successes at it. The good thing is we can look at what other universities have done and see the mistakes they've made, because there have been mistakes, like the University of Calgary president said to me, don't build a hotel on campus, um, right? Because that's what they did, and, and it was a disaster for them. So there are lots of learnings from other institutions across country. But now universities are in the business of managing their lands to try to leverage revenue to support teaching and service. And, and um, so I will say that it's not... It's not the main purpose, but it is now out of necessity, I think universities have had to go that route. Right? Not, that, not necessarily that I want to, but I think that if, if we're going to do something, let's look at the places where we can leverage the most opportunity and learn from our colleagues across the country who have used it. Brian. So I want to speak directly to this point. Uh, as a result of a, a comment at a, a joint meeting uh, with the U of S and, and ministry people, about why they have so much revenue per student compared to us. Uh, they spoke to their active involvement in, in their land assets and their endowments. And that triggered a thought on, in, in my mind, and I got one of my staff to do some modeling on the funding formula and the impact of additional revenue in that funding formula. And the, what we did was we assumed that we had a, an additional million dollars to spend somehow, from land revenue or borrowings or whatever. And we used it to hire research productive faculty. And we used the, the faculty of engineering as a model of how much research you could expect from a full-time faculty member. And we then plugged the, 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 
the additional research and faculty numbers and, and so on into the funding formula. And lo and behold, once those numbers had worked their way through the model, so that's five to eight years later, we were generating a million dollars more in provincial government funding. The thing paid for itself. There's no reason why we can't exploit the, the funding formula in a way that the University of Saskatchewan already has and generate more revenue and s provide more support to our faculty and generate more research activity. It can be done. The mechanisms are there. We just have to move forward with, with a way to find How many the, dollars? The, the, the revenues to, to, to plant into the university's operations to do it. Yeah, well, that's, thank, that's helpful. Comments? Any other additional comments? We've got five minutes left. Any? Anyone totally opposed to the next steps that I put out there? One of our students. Great. Yeah. Well, I've worked at the University of Saskatchewan. I've worked at the University of Alberta. They all have their research programs. I, one of the things that stands out me, at me here is uh, the community. Um, and I agree with what the last speaker spoke about. If you put some money into research and, develop, uh, and faculty, you'll get that money back in the funding formula. The more money that we can sh use to show that we're productive, we're creating opportunities, the more money we can solicit for additional operations or additional research, and it just snowballs. Uh, the research park, I think, is an interesting idea. Um, I know the U of S. If you, some of you may not know, the uh, Walmart next to the U of S is actually university land. Uh, which I'm not putting up a Walmart. <laughs> I'm just saying uh, uh, that. So, I mean, it's working for them, and it's providing extra revenue into their budgets yeah, and does, their, yeah. their internal processes. And I think that's something we should be looking at, uh, being that every year the government's got their hand, they're handing us money and then saying, well, wait a minute, we want some of it back. Um, and it's never going to change if we don't continue to build on our successes and create new successes. And... It almost looks like, well, you spent some money this way. Well, we're going to punish you this way. Uh, let's f look at why the, uh, fixing that. But also, I think investing in ourselves is a great approach to making things better. Investing in students. I can tell you that for, uh, uh, f having three uh, semesters a year instead of uh, three four-month semesters, could potentially benefit not only the students, but allows us to use the infrastructure that we already have that we're paying for 365 days a year for teaching, learning, research, and all those aspects that we aren't fully utilizing during the four months between uh, f winter session and fall session, uh, respectively, th through the summer. So. Uh, I think that this is a good starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michelle? Um, just one thing, I guess, to add to the mix as far as um, the maximizing programs as a 12-month institution. Um, thinking about when I am here in the summer and the amount of space that we do have available um, for subsidized uh, dormitory space to host people, I think that one thing for us to think about is to take a page out of the playbook of other campuses that are um, increasing their capacity to deliver uh, certificate programs and certificate um, upskilling, to, especially to frontline workers. I know that's what I'm partnering in with a project at University of New Brunswick in the summer. Um, I think it's an interesting opportunity to bring faculty in that are trained in the disciplines that are working with frontline workers, for example. Um, and that's an ever-expanding ever expanding field that's privatized and is deeply problematic and not accessible the way it's being delivered through a privatized model versus having it delivered through subsidized uh, practices through certificate and those are sometimes actually really effective laddering programs to bring people back into school that have been working on the front line and might want to pursue a, a degree after. So yeah, and residential programming around mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's lots of those emerging, and that's a great idea. Thanks, Michelle, for that. So I will encourage you to email 
let me know what your thoughts are and um, we'll move forward. I will say, tell you that after Christmas, we will also repeat this to tell you where we're at uh, once we get things moving forward. And if there are others that emerge, we will present them again to you in an open forum. Um, we, really, we really want this to work and we want to ultimately to make our campus better. There's nothing I hope you see here that we're trying to do um, in secret. We want to be open and as you have called, for the university administration to be open, transparent in everything we do. That's what I hope you you see what we're working, trying to work with you and move this forward. So I, I just want to, I'm thrilled with the, with the attendance today. I want to thank you so much. I know how busy this time of year is. And um, I want to say thank you. We'll be, we'll be proceeding. Yes, Mark. Will there be a press conference about the Walmart? <laughs> <laughs> now, I said that I'm not building a Walmart. Now, I, I could get in trouble for saying that, that I'm not, you know, thinking about eco economics well, so I probably shouldn't have even said that. But I, I have no plans for a Walmart at this time. I don't mean that, I don't mean to be critical of U of S in that respect. So thank you, everybody. Have a great, great day.